Welcome to the Dellingpod with me, James Dellingpod. And I know I always say I'm excited about this week's special guest, but I really am. We've got Andrew Tate, mixed martial art champion, kickboxing champion, and I think fair to say general troublemaker and COVID skeptic, <laughs> maybe, Andrew? A bit? Uh, skeptic. Is that is that the word we're going to give me now? Skeptic. I think it's far, far deeper than skeptic, my friend. Far yeah, deeper. Yeah. yeah. Before we go on, can I just say I really envy you, your, 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 your studio. I've got, as you can see, I've got the kind of bucolic, um, uh, uh, you know, views of sheep and stuff. But you've got yeah, the badass. You've got the... Yeah, I've got the logo and stuff. You've got the beautiful English countryside, my friend. You win. Don't worry about that. Well, 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 yeah. No, I mean, I, I think, I think that your your studio does look like a kind of evil villain's lair. Um, straight. It does a bit, yeah. It does, and I've got buttons like I can change the cameras and show different things, and you know, etc. I've got buttons that do things. You have know, you got, I don't really truly completely understand it. Have but you I'm got buttons there. that fire rockets and 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 like open up the floor where the sharks are underneath and that kind of shit? Basically, something like that. Yeah. If there's a guest I really don't like, I've got I've got contingencies. So you're you're in Bucharest, um, and I can't. I mean, even though I don't know much about Romania, I've been to Cluj Napoca once, but I just get the impression okay. that that Romania is probably one of the places which is gonna be better place to survive the apocalypse because i mean i can't imagine that there are many people who've had the death jab for starters well absolutely yeah there's certainly many people who have not had the death jab i think that uh it was one of the lowest vaccinated country lowest lowest vaccination rates for the countries in europe i think some of the western countries were actually panicking about it and telling the eu look we have to do something about romania we have to do something about romania and a lot of the laws here the covid laws especially were just eu mandated it's kind of crazy how the european union uh, democracy, right? Let's still go. Don't send me down that path. Yeah. But the European Union is just forcing Romania to put these new laws and rules in place, which Romania wasn't interested in. The population wasn't interested in. And it was, yeah, really strange. They tried very, very hard to get people to get the vaccine here and it didn't really work. So yeah, they, that's... I think a natural, they, they have a natural distrust for the government, which is based on corruption and all these other things. So when the government comes along and tells them to do something, they naturally are more skeptical than, let's say, a Western country, which believes for some reason that the government cares about them. I don't know where they get that idea from. By the way, but, you're you're still looking off at the wrong camera. Um, could people look? look yeah, look, you're looking at. Yeah, that's right. Look at this one. Okay. Other, otherwise, you look shifty, and I'm sure, I'm sure it's not the effect you want to. Uh, convey oh, i'm not shifty <laughs> i'm not shifty no of course not you have got i have to say Andrew, um i hope you don't mind me saying so you you've got a kind of dick van dyke accent because you've got because you're part english and part american aren't you and you keep veering between the two yeah most most people can never guess where i'm from so yeah i'm, I'm like a mongrel i'm like a street dog bro i'm from everywhere i'm half american half english living in romania here there and everywhere six months of the year i'm traveling as well so Plus my ethnicity, no one can quite put their finger on. So no one has a clue where I'm from. I'm, I'm really like a mongrel. I'm like one of them street dogs you find. Yeah, but a kind of a, a sweet mongrel that you'd be happy to have in the household. Because apart from anything else, apart from being nice, it would also kill anyone who tried to get inside the house that was an enemy, yeah? Well, isn't that the definition of a nice man? I think that it was, uh, I've heard it a few times before, but a nice, a good man is not necessarily a harmless man. A good man is a man that can do harm and decides not to. So I think that that's one of the basic tenets of masculinity is the capability to be violent. And I made a career out of being violent and I decide not to be violent, but that doesn't mean I can't be violent. I, yeah, I think, there's, I think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying. And I, I don't know how, I expect you, you are as far down the rabbit hole as I am. And you, yeah. you probably share my suspicions that that really what's happening now is the culmination of decades, if not centuries of, of planning. And, and one, of, one of those things would be the emasculation of our culture, discouraging men from being men, discouraging men from having sexual relationships with women. Uh, anything that's yep. gonna kind of strengthen and further the human race has been worked against by the powers that be. When, when men get angry, that's how revolutions start. Like you can call me as sexist as you want, but screaming females don't cause revolutions. It's screaming men who cause revolutions. And when people say that's not true, women go marching. Da -da. Yeah, women go marching, but without men 
beside them at the barriers without men in police uniforms to protect them. No one's going to care about them or their ideas and none of their ideas are going to be enforced, right? It's only men getting angry in large groups that governments are afraid of because we are the ones who are combative. So if they can reduce our appetite for combat or our appetite for conflict, then that makes it a lot easier for them to inflict anything they decide to inflict upon us. It's, it's like the days of old, right? The, the, the invading army would come in and kill all the military age males or all the boys, which will soon grow to fighting age. And they did that on purpose so that they could do whatever they wanted with the society. Yeah. And now they're trying to do the same thing, but they're just mentally castrating men to the point where they are upset with the life they're in and they're depressed and they're confused and they're too busy chasing their own tail, trying to pay the rent to wake up and look around them and understand how badly they're being screwed. And that's what they're deliberately doing. And they're trying to kill the masculine spirit because they need the masculine spirit gone to inflict their tyranny. Yeah. Uh, not, not, I know, I know I sound like a, I sound like an optimistic guy right now. Don't I? I sound like Mr. Happy, but uh, no, it's truth. It's truly really what's happening. Andrew, I wish I could disagree with you. I'm afraid to say I'm, I'm in a, in a black pit of, of despair. I, I, I try and remain cheerful because I think that yeah. black humor and optimism and a sense of kind of we shall overcome is really important in any war. But I think things are really, really dire right now. I mean, tell me, tell me what you think is happening and where, and where do you think things are going? I think that the people who are in charge of the world are not motivated by what most people think they're motivated by. I've had a lot of people who are semi awake come to me and say, yeah, COVID, all this stuff. It's all about money. It's all about profit. And I, I sit there and say, okay, but I would actually feel a lot more comfortable with the world if it was as simple as money and profit. I think it's far more sinister than that. And I think it's truly about brutal power. And I'll say this because if you've had money long enough and you've truly had true money, it does get boring quickly. And I'll give you an example from a personal perspective. I grew up in a council estate in Luton, now a multimillionaire. Yeah, I love nice cars and et cetera, et cetera. But you can only eat so many steaks and go to so many nice hotels. Mm -hmm. the, what's truly what most people who are searching for money are looking for is power. And if you're born into money, if you've had money since the day you were born, if you've never known poverty, if you've never been denied anything, a Ferrari is not going to make you happy. A nice meal is not going to make you happy. You've always had these things. The one thing that's going to make you happy is, is power. I don't think most people understand how humans are evolutionarily designed to want power. We, we're, we're wired to want power. People, men say, I want to be rich. You don't want to be rich. You want to be powerful. You want to be important. You want to be respected. This is the reason why men work their asses off in middle management jobs, underpaid, barely seeing their families, because at least when they're at work, they're respected. Men want respect. Men want power. And the people who are in charge of the world want more and more power. They don't care about profit. They don't care about money. They print the money. This is not about money. This is about just putting their foot on 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 top of humanity and squashing it for nothing other than an ego trip i really do believe it's about that i believe they enjoyed things like vaccine passports simply to make us stay home so that when they don't stay home it was a big joke ha 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 look at them stuck in their house i think they enjoyed it on that primal evil level i think it's genuinely evil i don't think it's anything to do with money i think it's purely just power trip yeah no i i agree with that and i think that that answers actually one of the the questions that's often asked by people who are kind of just beginning to discover what's going on but are still skeptical and they say things like yeah but why is it in the interests of the elite to 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 kill so many people or to do all this because surely they need us as as workers or and surely they need a, a global economy which is producing lots of stuff these people really are wedded to this vision of the world which has been given them as children fed them the idea that yeah everyone benefits from a from a, a strong economy and they don't understand that we are run by fucking psychopaths yeah absolutely and and the the whole idea of a, an economy is something that they need to understand they need to unplug from an economy is for us peasants economies yeah. don't matter to the people who print the money economies don't matter for the people who manipulate the stocks economies don't matter for the people who who read the elections and none of that is none of that is real to them they don't give a shit about the, the economy. You think these people are gonna go broke if the stock market crashes? You think they're gonna be poor? They're gonna have anything they want all the time. They are so beyond money that the only time they can get any satisfaction from their life, the only time they can even feel alive is with power trips.
That's, that's, that's truly what it is. If I don't know how deep and how dark we're going to go down this on this podcast, but even if you look at a lot of the disgusting things that are happening on islands around the world, I truly think that a lot of that is driven by the fact that not only is it disgusting and they have their sexual deviance, but it's also about the fact that look what we can do that other people are not allowed to do. It's power. It's they just want to feel important and special. And money is not enough anymore. Money, when you're born with money, money does not make you feel important and special. They need something else to satisfy their disgustingly large demonic egos. And if that means locking everyone in their house so they can't see their grandma, so be it. And I say this to people and they say, no, surely that's too simple an explanation that the people in charge of the world are just power tripping. No, it's not too simple an explanation. That's exactly what is happening. When you tell a full grown adult to wear a mask, go and walk and sit down in a restaurant, take it off, eat, stand up and put it back on to walk to go piss and then walk back, take it off and sit down and eat. That's pure power game. That's nothing to do with science, nothing to do with saving lives. That's just ha ha ha. Look what the peasants will do on command. That's all it is. What else could it possibly be? And isn't it amazing that the, the peasants largely did do it on command? None of them, none of them question this stuff. It's extraordinary. It, it truly is extraordinary. And what's most extraordinary to me is that I keep reminding people of these things. Like I keep saying, don't you remember three months ago when they said, if you didn't inject yourself with an unknown drug, you couldn't have food. It's only been three months. Okay, yeah, Putin's ended COVID with his new distraction, blah, blah, blah. But don't you remember what they did to you? I, I got invited recently to Australia. I said, I'm not going. And they said, why? I said, I won't go there ever again because they're communists and I'm not going to that country. And they're like, oh, but it's okay now. No, it's not okay now because all the members of law enforcement have proven the fact that they're given the commands to crush their fellow man with basically no reason that they'll do it. Yeah. So fuck them and fuck that country. I'm not going. I'm not going to Canada. I'm not going anywhere in these places. It's crazy. And the, all these people still have positions of power. And it's amazing to me that people are living their lives going, oh, yeah, everything's fine now. Knowing that the police above them with one simple email will literally destroy their fellow man. They don't give a shit. It's incredible that not one police force stood up and said, no, enough of this junk. It's, it's like, I don't, it's, it's absolutely out of control. It's crazy. Yeah, it is. I, I have to say, I mean, apart from the fact that you're probably slightly better at handling yourself in a fight than me, um, this is like, this is like talking to myself because I don't find <laughs> any of the stuff you are saying crazy or extreme. And yet, if you'd, if we'd had this conversation five years ago, I think yeah. I would have thought you were basically a nutcase and that you were so out there that I wouldn't know really how to engage with you. How can I ask, how long have you, when did you wake up to this, this kind of stuff? Was it, was it yeah. last two years or before? It was before that, but I won't lie that COVID really did kill my last hope in humanity because even before COVID, even though I was quite aware and quite awake of a lot of things that were happening, I, if you would have told me the COVID scenario, yeah. two years, a uh, disease that nobody can basically see or feel. Everyone's fine on the street. It's a sniffle. They advertise the fact it's 99.9% .9 survival. They won't let people see their own dying parents. You have to wear a mask. You have to take a vaccine that's more dangerous than the disease itself. That If you would have told me that before COVID, I would have said, no way. Surely that's too much. Yeah. But here we are. And they got away with it. it. It truly is absolutely incredible. And you, it's kind of been an interesting thought experiment for me, how you can extrapolate it to all other aspects of life, right? Because when I talk about the COVID scandemic, when I talk about it, I talk about how it applies to everything else. So recently I was talking to someone yesterday and they were talking about buying a house. And they said, and I said, why do you buy and you don't rent? He goes, oh, I want to own a home. And I said, you don't own a home. And he goes, what do you mean you don't own it? I said, look at the Canadian truckers. They didn't take their vaccine. They got a fine for rebelling against the vaccine. They don't pay the fine. And then they escalate the fine, add more money to it. You don't pay that. And eventually, what do they do? They come for your assets. So you don't own a house. You think you own something until you annoy the government. You don't own that house. You don't own that land. You don't own your car. You don't own your children. You don't own any of it. Because as soon as you make them angry, as soon as you resist tyranny deep enough, they'll take it from you. So COVID woke me up to a bunch of things. Like I used to, I sold all my real estate. I was like, no, I no longer trust governments. I don't know which one's going to come along with some new authoritarian garbage, and I don't want to comply. And the first thing I do is come for my assets. So like, it, for me, it's changed my entire worldview to the point now where I'm like, I don't trust governments. I don't trust real estate. I don't trust banks. I don't trust any of them. They're all the enemy. And once you wake up to that, it's kind of a dark realization. I think that's why a lot of people just say, I'll just wear the mask. I'll just wear the mask. Because it's, 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 it's cowardice, right? And it's easier. 
Yes. Where, so where, I mean, if you're, if you're allowed to tell me, where, where, do, where, where are your, all your assets now? Are they in gold or Bitcoin? Yeah. So, so I'm, yeah, I, I'm a big proponent of cryptocurrency. I love cryptocurrency. And then also I think that um, there are certain governments which are more favorable than others. There are certain governments in which I'm prepared to take the risk of owning an asset and there's certain governments in which I won't, but the free countries of earth, sometimes the country, not sometimes, I apologize for using that word because it's not sometimes, the countries which are labeled as the most free democratic nations on earth, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, et cetera, were the worst yeah. of all of them. So like the whole, it's kind of crazy. I, I have a lot of money now sitting in a dictatorship. I would rather have my money in a dictatorship with a dictator who I b believe in and trust more than these democratic nations because I don't even believe in democracy anymore. I don't, I don't believe in any of it. And I didn't really, it was always like a 50-50, but COVID woke me up to everything. It's just like, it's absolutely crazy what a government will do to you if they are instructed. And it's more crazy what your fellow man will do to you. It's, it's not to be a pessimist, but it's kind of crazy now. Like when I see a police officer on the street, I'm like, yeah, you're fine now. Oh, you're all smiles now. But if it was still during COVID, you'd be trying to beat the shit out of me for not wearing a mask. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. forgive and I don't forget. You know, I don't forgive and I don't forget. And I'm kind of lucky I live in Romania. This is one of the reasons I love Romania is because Romania is a corrupt country, right? Yeah. But what's amazing about corrupt countries is, at firstly, let's, let's, let's change, the, let's change the, the definition. Every country on the planet is corrupt. Mm -hmm. America is the most corrupt country on the planet. So they're all corrupt. And the Western nations are more corrupt than anything else. But at least in the, in the countries which are notorious for corruption, everyone can play. I like the poor countries because everyone can be corrupt. If I don't want to wear a mask and a police officer comes up to me and says, wear a mask, say no. And I give him 10 pounds to leave me yeah. alone. I prefer that than them to come along and pretend there's law and order. And there is law and order to destroy my life. But if I'm an, if I'm an elite, I can go to an island and do whatever I want. Do you understand what I'm saying? So uh, every single country is corrupt. And now it's shifted my mental view to the point where I want to live in a, in a place where I genuinely feel free. And I don't think any of the Western nations are free on any level because you have to be afraid of the government. So you have to try and find countries which are more susceptible to personal freedom. And that's, and that, a lot of that it comes down to corruption. This guy doesn't want to do this, but he paid this, so leave him alone. Yeah. And, and I prefer that system of governments now as opposed to England or where are these other countries that go, this is the law, this is the law. And everyone's like, it's like, it's like Star Wars, bro, like the drones. It's like, wake up. Like, what can I say to you, Mr. Police Officer? Do you believe this crap? But it's the law. It's, it's it's crazy, bro. It's crazy. I think you're right. I think you you and I were, were both brought up in systems where we were taught that kind of America, the United Kingdom were the envy of the world, the bastions of freedom and and free speech and English common law and in the UK and the and the, the Supreme Court in America and nothing to fear. Actually, we were lied to. And you're right. I think. Eastern Europe, the former Eastern European countries, they know what it is like to live under crushing tyranny, and they are much right. less trusting in government than we are, than we are in the West. Correct. And, and it's also, then you have to look at other forms of governance, right? Because what is, the, what is the role of a government? I mean, the role of a government is to keep a country functioning. Yeah. But if you look at, I can, I can talk about Eastern Europe exclusively because I spend a lot of time up here, but let's even look at Romania. Romania as a whole, Bucharest as a, as a city, is at least 20 times safer than London. Now, is that because of the police force? Well, I highly doubt it because the police force is massively underfunded and they're driving around in tiny old Dacias. Like <laughs> they're, not, they're, not, they're not a militarized police force. I understand why Dubai is safe because Dubai is rich and has one of the most advanced police and law enforcement systems on the planet. You can't escape the Dubai police. I get it. Whereas Romania, there's none of that. So why is Romania so much safer than London? Because it's the most Christian country on earth. It's 99.9% .9 Christian because of everyone knows their neighbor, because of family and societal values and traditions, because the fact that 99.9% .9 of the people who live here are ethnic Romanians. I, when I, I've been in a taxi before and we were driving and there were some girls walking through a park. It was 3.30 in the morning. I said to the taxi driver, girls don't walk through the park at, alone at night in London. And the taxi driver said to me, yeah, but they're Romanian girls. A Romanian man wouldn't hurt a Romanian girl. When have you heard that in England? Ever. Yeah. And so, so I'm saying, so you look at governance, what happens is in Western countries, because society has largely failed, because the families failed, religions failed, cultural homogenies failed, uh, we have no ideology that binds us, we've completely failed. So the government stepped in to try and keep everything under lock and control instead. And the only way they can do that is by becoming a police state. And that's what you have like America. This is why I say I don't live in America. I say, look, 
If I'm going to live in a police state, I'll live in Dubai. At least I have my safety. I'm not going to live in a police state like America where the criminals might kill me. The cops might kill me. The judicial system might lock me up for no reason. Like everyone's against you in these places because they're trying so hard when, when things get out of control in a society, the government's answer is more laws, more laws, stricter punishments, more police, more police, more laws, more laws. And then you get to a position like America where you can't even live your life without committing a felony. There's a really interesting book called Three Felonies a Day. And it's a story of a person who's just living a normal life and they accidentally commit three felonies a day by answering phone calls or uh, replying to an email the wrong way. And they're, they're making the point that if the police want you and they want to put you away, they're going to find a reason to put you away. Yeah. And that's what it's like in the West now. The police will come and raid your house at any minute, take all your electronics and find an excuse to lock you up if the government there says so. You want to talk about justice and law, like you said, the Supreme Court, all this stuff. You're living under systems where if you piss the government off, they don't need a reason. Trust me, because they'll find one and you're done. It's crazy, man. It's really crazy. And the more and more I learn about the world, and the more and more I see these kind of things. COVID just woke me up to it. I, it, I just got woken up to the fact that I don't want to rant. I, I can carry on. I can continue. No, I like your ranting. Yeah, you, okay, I'll keep going then. Right? If you don't mind the ranting. If you don't mind the ranting. Here's what most people don't understand, especially people who live in a Western country. Because I've heard this before. I had a girl say to me, I don't believe in violence. I said, yes, you do. She goes, no, I don't. I don't believe in violence. I don't think people should be violent. I said, you believe in violence because if someone attacked you, you'd call the police and they'd be violent for you. You believe in violence by proxy because you're incapable. But you do believe in violence. If someone were to come here and try and harm you and the police officer to turn up, you wouldn't want a police officer who says he doesn't believe in violence. Everyone believes in violence and every single part of civilized society is underpinned by violence. This is what you don't understand. You walk around the English countryside. Yeah, it's a beautiful country. I love England. I grew up in Luton, right? That's not a nice part, but I know England's a beautiful country. But every single law is underpinned by violence. You get a parking ticket, 65 pounds. You don't pay it. Goes to court. They double it. You don't pay it. Goes to an enforcement agency, bailiffs, you don't pay it. Now it's up to 1,300 pounds. You still don't pay. You get a court, it's CCJ against you. You don't pay that. Now you owe five grand. Then they come to your house. They say you owe us five grand. You refuse to pay that. Then they come to take your house. Eventually, at some point when you resist, what's going to happen? You're going to be arrested by force. Everything in the end runs down to violence. The only reason there's fines and punishments, all these other things, is because you know if you don't comply long enough, the state will get violent with you. The state has the monopoly on violence. And when you look at things like COVID, which are completely and utterly unjust, you see how quickly the violence comes out. They were beating people in the head with batons because they, oh, were, they were resisting. Oh, yeah. They were. I was one of the demos me. when they did that. It was extraordinary. I mean, actually, I, I just nipped off to, I nipped off to McDonald's when the police charged because I was thinking, well, there's not much, nothing doing here. And I came back to find that, that you know, middle-aged women, elderly women had been beaten on the head by the police. Yeah. For what it was a completely peaceful demonstration. Absolutely. The state will get violent with you out of nowhere. So when you live in countries where the state is so strong and the state is so supported and the state is so sponsored by the general populace, you have to accept that the general populace is very, very happy for, for the government to kick the shit out of you. And that makes life difficult. I don't want to live in a country like England anymore where most people go, well, the government decided. I don't care what they decided. They're criminals. I don't give a shit what they decided. Because they're criminals and they just send their goons to be violent with you if you don't instantly comply. The whole idea of fines and, and judges and court and law, there is nothing just or fair about the legal system. There is nothing, there is no fairness left. I can tell you the names of people who are in jail right now who shouldn't be in jail. You know exactly who I'm talking about. The amount of people who walk free, who shouldn't walk free. All the systems of earth are corrupted. The World Health Organization's corrupt. The banks are corrupt. The political systems are corrupt. The judicial system's corrupt. It's all absolutely and utterly corrupt on every single level. I don't have faith in any of it. Mm. And that's why I like living in nations where no one else has faith in it either. Because then you at least know if they push too hard, there will be enough numbers on the streets to prevent it. And that's what's happened. The reason there was no COVID lockdowns in Africa is because people need to eat. So they got up and went to work. And if you tell them not to eat, they said, get fucked. That's what happened. And it was over in a week. You know, it's, it's crazy. So, yeah, I mean, COVID woke me up to a lot of things I already knew. But when, when I started getting fines, because I got fined in Germany for not wearing a mask. I got fined a bunch of places for not wearing a mask. And I was saying, explaining to my mother, saying, this fine is a threat of violence. She goes, no, it's not. It's a fine. I was like, no, you don't, no, you don't understand where this leads because I ain't going to fucking pay it. And, and, and it, it wakes you up to things, man. I really am. I really do dislike. I have a genuine distaste for the Western world. I think it's disgusting, all of it. 
Uh, yeah, I agree. I think that the West is, what I now know about the West, and I've only learned this in the last two years, I find it utterly dis indefensible. I mean, uh, Douglas Murray, a, a, a conservative commentator, has yep. just written a book about, about the war against the West. And I'm thinking, well, if there is a war against the West, it's a damn good thing. And it's about time that yeah. the West was over because the West is not as it was sold to us. It's not, it's not the leader of the free world. Exactly. And it's kind of crazy how quickly it's all fallen apart, because when I think a lot of the reputations that the West survives on were actually quite true not too long ago. I mean, in 1986, when I was born, I'm sure that places like California or London were the best places on the planet, right? Eastern Europe was communist, complete communist bloc. Asia was, was a mess. Africa was even worse than it is now. South America was unlivable. So I'm sure that in 1986, L.A., London, Paris, Sure, they're probably the greatest places on the planet. Here we are 35 years later. And when I walk the streets of Paris, I feel literally, on, I feel like I'm in Iraq. Like I feel it feels dangerous to even exist there. So it's crazy how quickly they've fallen apart and they're still surviving on their old reputations. I had um, a friend come visit me from, funnily enough, from Australia. And we did a little tour of Europe. And he said, I was so excited to see London, Paris, these places. And they massively disappointed me. But the places that no one talks about, like Poland, is gorgeous. I was like, yeah, because Poland, Poland, Poland's reputation hasn't caught up to what it is. And the other countries are surviving off an old reputation that doesn't exist anymore. So it's kind of like people's minds haven't caught up yet. But a lot of places in the Western world are also becoming literally unlivable. Yeah. It, it, I don't, pe pe people don't know where else to go, but it's true, man. You, you don't want to live in Paris nowadays for what? Leave. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Although I think that, yeah, that, that, that past you described where, places like London, Paris, New York were, were kind of civilized and agreeable places to live. Uh, the reason that the other places in the world were so shitty was often because the, the powers that be were obliterating them or deliberately undermining their economies in order to enrich them. So the Beirut, for example, I mean, Beirut in the 1970s must have been one of the most wonderful places in the world to live. And then look, look what they did to it. And I don't, I, by they, I, I, I really don't know who exactly the they is. I mean, do you? It's just like the, the powers that be. Yeah, completely. I mean, and, and that's even happening right now. I mean, I'll tell you now, you look at Ukraine, the, yeah. the, the situation in Ukraine was completely, I believe it's completely NATO's fault. They, they knew what they were doing. They kept yes. prodding Russia. They kept poking the bear. They kept poking the bear. They kept poking the bear. And now that Russia is finally retaliated, which it had no choice but to do within its, when its own self-interest, right? He had to eventually do something. It has been going on a long time. He eventually retaliated. I'm very, very glad NATO hasn't stepped in. Of course, I don't want war, World War III, but we're just sending loads and loads of weapons to delay the inevitable, just to cause more casualties and more, more pain for both sides, more headaches for Russia. You think the Americans give a shit? Ukraine could just roll over, give up what they give up what Russia wants and just end all of it. Right. But because yeah. that's what's going to happen in the end. But no, we want to make sure that Russia loses as much money, time and money and men as possible. Who cares if a million Ukrainian civilians die? Let's keep sending javelin missiles and let's control the media narrative. If you scroll through Twitter, the media narrative they're purporting is that if you make Molotov cocktails, you can take out Russian tanks. You're going to get annihilated. Like it's, it's, it's literally they're, they're, they're convincing men, people to commit suicide. It doesn't matter because that just uh, puts up the civilian casualties, adds to the narrative they need to make Russia the bad guy. And the worst thing about all of this, we made all these sanctions, these unprecedented sanctions against Russia. And now we're suffering mass inflation and fuel crises. And the rubles are all time high. Have you seen that? The I have seen bounced, this, but it. It crashed. And that was the all time high when it was the point. E economically, or in, in, as geopolitical power play, Putin has played a, a blinder by, by charging for Russian oil in, in rubles. <laughs> you know, You're he's right. undermined the petrodollar, the very thing, the, the, the one grip that America had over the world, that it had the kind of the global reserve currency. And Putin's taken yeah. it away from them. It, 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 and they, they handed him that, that goal, didn't they? I mean, they didn't need to do that. They didn't need to have these Completely. That's it. They literally handed him the way out. And if, if people think Russia is the only country who's going to do this, then they're, they're sadly mistaken. Because what America has shown is if you don't agree with everything we want geopolitically, that your sovereign debt is no longer safe. And there's a whole bunch of countries in the world, China being the next one, who are taking a long, hard look at that going, OK, well, if we're not safe to have dollar debt, then we're not going to do it. Yeah. And then America's in big trouble. I mean, empires never last long, right? I think we all know about the cycle of empires. Yeah, yeah. I think if you look at the 
you know, you look at the cycle of empires, you look at how Rome fell. The American empire as it is, is pretty much near the end. It, it's kind of crazy how, I mean, Americans can't get along about anything. I'll give an example, right? I was in Dubai recently. I love Dubai. I think it's a, it's a safe place. There's people from all around the world who go there. You can walk the streets at night with a million dollar watch. You have nothing to worry about. And because there's none of this political division, the leader of Dubai is focused on building Dubai into the best city he can imagine it to be. Whereas if you look in the West to our political systems, we're so busy fighting each other, infighting, corruption this, corruption that. It's just crazy. If you look at the American political system, how much time, money, and effort is wasted just fighting against each other? Before, before they worry about their geopolitical enemies on the outside, before they worry about enhancing the lives of normal Americans, the Senate is just constantly out for itself. It's, and, and I'm not saying that democracy is a bad thing. I'm just saying the current democratic systems we have, at least in the West, have just eroded to the point now where they're it's a not, joke. It's not they're democracy. Not joke. It's something else. It, it's, it's, they call it representative democracy. It's not. I mean, like, so every four years you get to vote in a, a new bunch of crooks who are the same as the old bunch of crooks. And, and, and suddenly they're in charge and you don't get any vote anymore. That's the thing. Yeah, it's completely true. And and then and that's if you don't want to go in the rabbit hole of do you even get a vote? Because there's also that rabbit hole we can go down. Oh, well, well, I'm no, to the I, yeah. I mean, where are you on the on the rigged elections? Uh, presumably you don't think that a senile, incontinent um, crook in the pay of the CCP with a son who <laughs> who's involved with, you know, underage sex and God knows what else. Yeah. You don't think he was voted on a legitimate popular vote, do you? I absolutely don't think that. I think, you know, what's crazy is that I was telling, I was arguing this point with somebody and they were saying, oh, why do you not think he won legitimately? And I said, I'll tell you why. Because the matrix this is what I call them. You say who, and you don't know who they are. And I don't know who they are, but I call them the matrix. That's just my personal thing. The matrix, right? Because we're, I don't want to say we're living in a simulation, but the matrix, if you watch the movie, they control everything. They know everything, right? So mm. the matrix, they put Hillary out to destroy Trump. And they, the entire media said there was a 99% chance of Hillary winning. The, all the media was on her side. They made Trump look like a racist. They spun all of the media against Trump. And then Hillary's been in, in government forever. She's the favorite. They played all the feminist card. First woman's president, blah, blah, blah. And she lost. So I believe that was a fair election. And the matrix itself panicked. They're like, whoa, that was, that was a sure win. And we lost. So if you think that for their next chance to attempt to attack Trump, which is someone they can't control, because Trump is the kind of person who you, he ain't going to listen to you for money. He has enough money. He doesn't care. They said, we have to have our matrix representative in charge. Do you think they're going to trust Joe Biden to win without any kind of help? Do you think they're going to sit there and go, well, Hillary lost, but this senile man will win? Or do you think they're going to say, no, we're going to use Joe Biden because he doesn't know what's going on and we'll make sure he wins? Which one makes more logical sense? I, I was talking this with someone and I said, look, look, if me and you were to go play basketball outside for $10,000 and you had the possibility to cheat, you'd cheat because you want the money. And he goes, yeah. I said, so you think they won't cheat to control the most powerful country on the planet? You'll cheat in a basketball game. <laughs> you, think, you think they won't cheat to control the world? Mm. <laughs> like, of course they would. Of course they would. And then you look at the French election that just happened. How do these World Economic Forum leaders who nobody likes keep winning? Yeah. Over and over. Nobody likes me. They can't even walk the street in their own country. They're despised. And yet everyone who's aligned with the WF seems to keep winning. That's a coincidence. So I think that's a strange coincidence, my friend. Very, very strange. Yeah. There's a, there's a weird thing about the, the World Economic Forum. And I, and I have to say, I think they've, they've played an absolute master stroke. Uh, whenever you talk to people who aren't where we are about the World Economic Forum, they always say, yeah, but it's just a kind of talking shop. It's just a conspiracy theory. It's not, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's not real. Why, why do you think that this thing called the World Economic Forum has any power? And you're like, have you, have you seen the WEF website, you know, where you can own nothing and be happy? Have you, have you not seen Klaus Schwab boasting about having infiltrated every major government with his, his trainees? And still they go, yeah, but come on. I mean, th that's not how the world works. Where do you go from there? How do you persuade? How do you talk to these people? And that's the point. And I think that the, the real problem that we're suffering from in the world, the true problem is cowardice. It's not that people are incapable of understanding, because like you said, they, the Klaus himself will tell you what he's doing. Everyone knows what he's doing. But if they accept these things, 
then they have to be compelled to act for themselves and for their family and for their future. And most people are such cowards. They'd rather be ostriches and bury their head in the sand. That's what it is. I don't think it's an ignorance problem. I think it's a cowardice problem because like you said, anyone can go to the World Economic Forum website and read it. Anyone can see what they're going to do, but they'd rather not know. It's cowardice and it's selfishness. And this is another thing that's really interesting about the modern world. We've built a world in which people are ultimately and utterly selfish, especially the Western world. It's been very, very well orchestrated. You go to an apartment block in England and you knock on a random apartment and say, how many of your neighbors do you know? Um, Maybe that guy saw him once. Nobody talks to anybody. Nobody knows anyone. Nobody cares about anyone else. And when you do that, It's very, very well done. It's one of the reasons they push for this multiculturalism. It's one of the reasons they push for diversity. It's one of the reasons they push a lot of their agendas. When you do that, when people become purely self-interested, then you have a very self, you have a very shallow worldview, right? Because even me as an individual, when I, if I become purely self-interested, the only thing I care about is getting money, getting more money. Hmm. And it doesn't, and and most people will get more money at the expense of others. They're like, oh, I make a bunch of money and who cares in this coal mine, wherever those people starve or the diamond mine. If you make people selfish, then you just purely chase the dollar. Nobody cares about their community anymore. Nobody cares about their religion, their race, none of these things. Nobody cares about any of that. So when you add selfishness plus cowardice, people will just sit there and go, oh, well, maybe they are doing all these things. But you know what? I just got a raise at work. And if I just keep my head down and take my vaccine, I can get a new car next year. And that's it. And that's it. That's it. That's the end of the game. So they don't want to know. They don't want to know because if they accept it, they have to do something. Their entire worldview crumbles. People are afraid of their worldview crumbling. They're literally living in fear. They don't want their entire way they view the world, their entire paradigm to shift because they're cowards. Um, That's what it really is. Andrew, I am so enjoying this podcast. It's like, (laughs) it's like talking to... It's good to talk to someone who gets it though, right? Because we spend our whole lives just fucking trying to tell people who don't get it. So it's good to talk to people who understand what's happening. It's really frustrating. Look, I, I so I, I had this event the other day with um, Majid Nawaz, and it was like six hundred of us, and yep. it was we were all on the same page, and it was a beautiful thing, and we've all got the same frustration, which is like the world is going to hell in a handcart, and yep. most of our friends and relatives just are going. Yeah, it's all going to get better once you know the Ukraine thing ends, and and you know Putin sees sense, and yeah. and and yeah. you know that it like like politicians they're just doing their best, they're just cocking up a bit, and you think no, we've got yeah. famine, which is being deliberately yeah. engineered. Yeah, uh, we're going to start. Yeah. Since when? Do, since when do food plants set on fire? Since when do they all explode? Have you noticed this? They're all blowing up. Like it's it's, it's like it's crazy. We'll come on to that. I just wanted to ask you to pick up on the, on the point you made before we before we got timed out by by Zoom, um, and that is about about courage, because I, I yeah. it must be quite interesting for you. You you've you've made your living um, getting in fights, which I yeah. imagine before you you go into the ring, it must be quite. Do you get nerves? Do you get? I mean, do you? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's one of the scariest things you can do. It's your life on the line, right? I've, I've seen people get knocked out and never wake up. You can die. It's, it's an extremely scary thing to do. Yeah. Right. Um, so, I mean, how do you, in, I, I mean, presumably mixed martial arts is the worst in terms of yeah. physical threat. To your I mean, they're all pretty bad. I mean, you can get hurt in all of them. And yeah. to be honest with you, the worst in terms of actual life-changing injuries is, is standard boxing. Is it? Because in MMA, if you get if you get wobbled or you get hurt, you usually get taken down, wrestled and and hit a few times. Or even if you take a kick to the head, you're usually out. But in boxing, if you're a well-trained boxer and you're very, very good, you can instinctually survive a long time even after you're basically concussed. So I, boxers will fight rounds and they don't remember any of it because their brain's completely rattled, but they have enough about them to, to bob and weave and keep throwing back. And it's much worse for the mind or the brain to keep taking damage when it's semi hurt, as opposed to just getting hit, getting knocked out and waking straight back up, you know? So uh, it's actually boxing that does the most injuries. Somebody um, once said this to me, and you can tell me whether it's true or not, because, you know, there's always talk about which is the best martial art for the self-defense or whatever, and, you know, we're surviving. Um, And I've heard that of all the martial arts, actually boxing is is the, the best in terms of, getting in a fight and and acquitting yourself well is that right you've absolutely nailed it bro boxing's the number one and i'm a kickboxer and i'll say that boxing is the best thing to do and there's there's a few reasons for that but the primary reason is that 
the number one rule of a street fight is that you never want to go to the ground. A lot of people practice jujitsu, wrestling, judo, these things, but you don't want to be doing that on the ground on, in a street fight because one, a lot of these moves, a lot of wrestling moves don't work the same when, when all, all bets are off, when they can bite, when they can eye gouge, those kind of things. Yeah. That's the first thing. Two, you don't know who his friends are. I mean, do you really want to be rolling around the floor with a dude and his friend comes up and football kicks you in the head? No, you don't. Three, he might have a blade on him. He pulls a blade out in the middle of a wrestling match. You're done. Four, you don't want to get arrested. I mean, with boxing, you can just hit him. One, two, bang, and run. That's what you should do. Smack him and run. Because you don't know. He might have 20 friends in the place. He might have a weapon on him. Like, if I hit a guy, I'm running. I'm not standing around to be rocky and, and be proud of myself. I'm out. Because the rule one of life is do not die. So boxing is nice and clean. <laughs> it prevents you from having to. It, it's true. Rule one of life, right? Yeah. Boxing is nice and clean. It prevents you having to wrestle, roll around the ground. I mean, I, I'm a kickboxer. I'm a world-level kickboxer. So my legs are probably some of the best on the planet. And how often am I going to kick on the street in jeans in a crowded nightclub? Never. You're just going to punch. So boxing's the one. Yes. Somebody mentioned to me that the inherent flaw of kickboxing is that you lift your lift your foot above the high above the ground, exposing your nether regions to attack. Is that is that true? Is that is that a I mean, I think the inherent flaw with it, I mean, kickboxing is obviously a, if you, if you were to put me in a cage against a man in a fair fight, my legs would hurt him badly. You know, I'd beat him up and I'd kick him and he'd deal with it. And he, I could kick him in the head, et cetera, et cetera. But true violence is not the same as a fair competition. And if I'm in a, if I'm on the street, I've got jeans on, it could be wet. It could be slippery. If I'm in a club and I kick and I'm, I'm on one leg, someone bumps into me, I'm off balance. I fall down. Now he jumps on top of me. It's just, you're just, you're just reducing your balance. Right. And it's the, the rule one of street fights is to stay on your feet. So you don't want to reduce your balance unless you can really help it. And especially in crowded areas with jeans on, or if there's three guys attacking you or someone bumps into you, you want to be on two feet if you can. Right. And in, in mixed martial arts, is anything allowed? No, no headbutts, no groin shots, no eye gouging, and no small joint manipulation. So usually you can't like bend the fingers or that kind of thing. But besides that, basically anything can go. Can you yeah. bite? You cannot bite. No, no, sorry, you can't bite. Either. I was going to say. No. So there are still rules. Yeah, there's a lot of rules. There's a lot of rules with the fair competition that don't exist on the street. But truthfully, I mean, the number one rule, like I said, of life is do not die. And if you can avoid street altercation, I absolutely not only recommend you avoid it because you don't know who you're messing with. And some people have nothing to lose. Yes. Truly nothing to lose. And yes. they're, they're, they're dangerous. Well, because, okay. So one of the things that, that the people say to me, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's, it's very flattering and, and, and charming and stuff. They say how brave I am speaking out. Yep. And, it, and it's true. I look at my colleagues, my former colleagues, let's say, from the, from the mainstream yeah. media when I was a kind of regular Joe Hack. And yep. I look at them and I'm thinking, you are craven, lily-livered scumbags. I mean, you know, I, 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 I despise you for not yep. speaking the truth because after all it's the end of our civilization we're talking about and you are participating in, in it by not speaking out but completely um i don't find it difficult to do what i do I, it, it seems obvious yep. it seems the right thing to do as a, as a man as a human being and everything else i mean is is, is being brave more difficult for other people or is it because i'm not brave really i'm just doing the normal thing well, tell, tell me about courage no, that's a really interesting question and a really interesting point. And I think that you just have something that a lot of people, unfortunately, are lacking today, and that's a strong morality. You see injustice. And when you see injustice, you're compelled to speak against it. And men have always been this way. You talk about men being reduced from our masculine imperative. The masculine imperative has always been against injustice. I think that men, because of our physical capabilities, have always had this innate ability to or this innate desire to try and fix the injustices of the world. If you look at any war or any combat or any conflict, everyone thought they were the good guy, right? Yeah. We have this innate yeah. ability to want to fix injustice. But as they reduce the masculine tendencies of the population, that disappears along with everything else. I don't think women have the same thing. I don't want to be sexist. I don't think women have this innate desire to fix injustices. I think women have an innate desire to fit in with the tribe. And I think that's more of a evolutionarily evolutionary survival instinct, right? Because women for a long time, they'd be sitting with their tribe and another tribe would come along and kill all the men. And now they belong to another tribe. And they'd be like, okay, well, yeah. if I want to survive, I need to take on these new customs quickly. And you can look at that, bro. You can look at World War II. The French women were with the Nazi soldiers. Like they, they, they didn't take them long before they started just going, okay, well, this is the winning team. <laughs> so that's yes. how women are. So women are far more likely to just bend to the will 
of of the tribe because they want to survive because they don't have any physical prowess. But men are not like that. And I think that but the fact that it's so unjust is what compels you. So I, I agree with you 100 percent. It's not difficult. I understand what you say. You nailed it. It's not difficult for me to sit here and say these things. I don't see this as brave. I just see this as massively unjust and I should stand up and speak against it. I feel like this is what I'm supposed to do. But as a lot of men lose their masculine imperative, they lose every single virtue of masculinity. And one of them is 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 the defense of, of justice. Yeah, I, I don't think this, this at all undermines your point, which I agree with, by the way. I mean, I, I, I very much believe in evolution evolutionary biology and I, and I look at history and stuff and I think what yeah. what you say about women's behavior makes absolute sense although I will say yeah. that on the marches and things and in the fight against things like COVID regulations and all this bollocks yeah. women have generally been the the, the the really feistiest people have have often been w- women more than men they've been the girls oh, absolutely been- I- Oh, completely. And I know some girls who've been standing up and doing some fantastic things. I didn't want to generalize because obviously yeah. if you generalize, you're going to miss, you're going to miss a bunch of people. The point I was trying to make is, and, and please, once again, feel free to disagree with me. The point I was trying to make is, is that if you put, okay, let me change it. Because when I say women, unfortunately now today, most men are basically women anyway, but if you take 10 yeah. high testosterone males, yeah, it's unfortunate, right? If you yeah. take 10 high testosterone males, And then you take five women and five low testosterone males and put them in two different groups. You have 10 and 10 and you put them in front of CNN. I believe the high testosterone males are more likely to look at it and just say that's bullshit. And I think that's because we're more prepared to defend our viewpoints. The problem is when you don't agree with the status quo, when you don't agree with what the propaganda machine tells you, you now are compelled to defend your point of view. And that to a degree, even if it's only verbal, is combat. So if you're the kind of person who is masculine enough to sit there and go, yeah, I'm prepared to argue this point, then you're more likely to disagree with the talking points of earth. But if you are unprepared to defend your point of view, if you're unprepared to to be in a confrontation, if you're unprepared to argue, then it's very difficult to not agree with everything you're told. How can you disagree with what you're told if you're not prepared to argue your point? You can't, right? And in general, in general, once again, in generalization, women can be more meek than men. And I think women in general also, once again, please generalization, women can also be more self, especially the young women of today are very much more self-absorbed than men. They don't care about society. They care about Instagram likes. They don't care. Yeah, I don't care. Yeah, yeah. So these are all generalizations I'm making, of course. And I know that a, a feist, they say there's no, no hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. I yeah, know there's been some women who are really angry about what's happened and they did a fantastic job and they're, they're soldiers. We need them like the rest, but it's just kind of unfortunate that well, I, I'm making generalizations, but it's, it's also applies to weak men. It doesn't, it's not only females. It's also weak men. If you're not prepared to stand up in front of 200 people and say, no, you are all wrong. And I am right. If you're not prepared to do that, then you're going to end up just agreeing with the status quo, no matter what they say. Yeah. The, the, the people are dolphins, men are women, sky's green, whatever. And you think, I mean, I don't know if you're, you're, you're quite a bit younger than me. I don't know how many of these kind of media invented media trends, I would say which have contributed yep. to, to our feminization. So, so there were, I think it was in the eighties or maybe the nineties, the, the concept of the new man and the new man was, yep. the new man was always pictured holding a baby. Look, I love babies. I, you know, when, I, when I was a dad of, yep. of young children, I love playing with them, but I played with them in a completely different way from the way their mother did. You know, I, yeah, I, I saw some ice on the lake in the park and I took them walking on the ice. To, because it yeah, was yeah, fun because yeah. and also yeah. it annoyed the passers-by who thought i was an irresponsible parent and i would yeah, yeah, throw yeah. them up in the air and i would do things that are you know i'd drop them drop them off height dangerous water. Yeah, yeah exactly because i think that's what dads are, are there for they're meant to be to 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 push the limits and 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 make them maybe less scared or expose them to risk and yeah give them an exciting time where oh. the mom is there to protect them I agree completely. Uh, and and, and us, that's also, this is why we, we talk about things and they extrapolate into all these other issues, but you nail it there. A lot of men today are basically just second mothers. They're, they're not a father, they're a second mother. Yeah. And, and, and by being a second mother, that also correlates to how the children are raised and how they view men and how they view masculinity as a whole. I mean, I can tell for, from my point of view, my father, my father was home two days a week. And I tell people that and they're like, oh, is, was he a good dad? I was like, he was a fantastic. Dads have always been away at war, down in the mines, yeah. out making money. Dads are a role model. My father was living a life of, of exceptionalism and I wanted to emulate him. 
and build myself into an exceptional person. I don't believe my dad would have been exceptional if he was home seven days a week, changing diapers and cleaning the kitchen. I don't think he would have been an exceptional individual. Yeah. So that, and, and, and that's just how it is. And I'm not saying you can't be home if you're a dad. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is if you're a father and you think that your role is basically second mother doing the same jobs the mom is, then I think on some degree you're failing. You're supposed to be trailblazing. You're yeah, supposed yeah. to be living a life that yeah. your children look at and go, wow, my father's brave. Wow, my father's courageous. My father has a strong moral code. You, you, you have to do with something that your, your children want to emulate. Yeah. And being a second mother and yeah. just sitting there and cleaning the kitchen, isn't it? That's yeah. it. No, I mean, it's really not so long ago. So, so I, I, I went through the, the private school system. And I know that yeah. had I been to boarding school, say, 50 years earlier, I would have been reading... Um, sort of uplifting, improving Victorian boys' own stories by G.A. Henty or maybe W.E. Johns, yeah. Biggles, Bigglesworth. And they were all about doing brave shit at the risk of your yeah. life and, and self-sacrifice, mm -hmm. serving your country. It was instilled yeah. in you. And I, yeah. I bought into that. I don't know why. I mean, you know, my, my dad wasn't particularly Victorian, but, but I, I just thought this was what you had to do as a man. Even though you can look at me. I mean, my... My arms are like sticks. I'm a complete, I'm a complete weakling, but I have forced myself to do, I mean, when, when I was younger, I used to do things I yeah. didn't want to do. I, I befriended the, the toughest or the, or the most dangerous boys in the school who always wanted to do things like climb the highest trees. And even though I yeah. wasn't the sort of boy who naturally did that, I felt that if you force yourself, then you become a better, and I, I did a bit. Completely. No, and 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 that's and that's what they're trying to remove, right? They're trying. They, we now live in a society where they pretend that the natural inclination for men to act masculine is bad. Yes, it's toxically masculine for a man to be a man. And what's so crazy about this goes back to my point earlier about the people saying they don't believe in violence. The same feminist who says that men shouldn't be toxically masculine will call a big, strong police officer as soon as she's in danger. It's a garbage idea. And if these ideas are actually tested by reality, they fail instantly. And that's why they're protected by the media machine and the propaganda machine, because they're not open for debate. They can't be debate. They can't defend them in debate and they can't defend them in reality. Yeah. They can only defend them in this coddled, strange society we've built of censorship. We are not allowed to contest their idi idiotic findings. Yeah. Any, any woman with a brain knows that you need big, strong men at some point in your life. Or you need men who are brave at some point in your life. You're going to need it. You're going to need some bravery. You're going to need some masculine bravery. But women are going to sit there and go, no, bravery is toxic. No, men shouldn't be that way. Da, da, da. It's clown world, bro. It's clown world. And yeah. it's genuinely the end of the empire. It's the end of the empire. We're falling apart from the inside out. We haven't got to worry so much about our outside enemies. We're falling apart right here, right now from the inside out. And that's what's happening when you have a life that's basically too comfortable. The closer... I'll tell you something. I've been all around the world. The closer that humans are to bear survival, the closer they are to their natural gender roles. If you go to a place which is poor and people are struggling, the women are feminine and the men are masculine. The men go out and hunt. The women keep the house and the kids and everyone sticks to their role because that's what gives humans the highest probability for survival. That's that you don't live any other way. But when we live in these coddled societies now in these cities where you can basically you there, we have people in societies now who are basically non-functional. And we, have, and we have people who are in charge of the information. The people who are in charge of the information are not only non-functional people, but they're living in non-functional companies. The, I'm telling you something. The ethos, the human rights ethos, and the way that a company like Twitter functions is completely non-competitive. You couldn't have a car manufacturer where half the staff have some... A mental defect and some event, invented anxiety disorder and half the staff have days off for no reason because they saw some mean words and half the staff are changing gender and half you couldn't function with any business with, with these kind of members of staff except for these companies that have these absolute insane monopolies which have no competition that allow them to have people working for them who aren't even in the real world so you have people who are not in the real world in companies which aren't even in a business world like if you, you can imagine a staff meeting at a social media company and compare it to a staff meeting at a coal mine. Like these people don't even function. <laughs> it's crazy. And yeah. they control all the information we're allowed to see and the opinions we're allowed to have. And we wonder why the world's gone down the black hole as fast, as quickly as it has. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. I, and, and actually on that subject of, of coal miners, I, I think that there was an ulterior motive in, in, in closing down, down, down the coal mines because 
you think about those strong communities where they had the kind of values that probably you and I would, would share, which are basically, I think, Christian Christian values. They are about yep. community, about, about hard work, about personal responsibility and so on. And they shut them down yep. and, and, and because they didn't want... It. Everything, I think, in our lifetimes has led till now. And this is the crunch point. Uh, I yep. mean, we've got we've got imminent food shortages, imminent supply chain breakdown. I think there's going to be massive civil disorder. Uh, so we are going to be reduced to that to that sort of Hobbesian state that you you say still exists in in countries where men and men men and women are women. You know, the sort of the harder. Yep. You know, that's going to be that's going to be forced on our our softer countries like certainly like the UK I don't I mean Romania sounds better off how do you think we're going to cope what's what, what, what how's it going to play out yeah it's really interesting and it's interesting because I, I truly believe society is only three days meals away from from complete chaos yeah let people not eat for three days and let's see what happens I like and we're and we're getting close to it yeah and if it happens it's going to happen because the matrix wants it to happen yes it does. and they, they they very much want it to happen I mean, we've talked about we we quickly we quickly brushed on the fact that food plants in America are just exploding at random, like five of them each every couple of weeks. Just like food processing plants are just just blowing up. Yeah, it's like since when does that happen? Since when does wheat explode? Yeah, like it's, since since when do eggs blow up? Yeah, like I I don't know what's ha- something crazy is happening, and they want it to happen, and they want that mass civil unrest, and I just hope things like this podcast. I hope that we can wake up enough people. That when these kind of things happen, I pray that although people are going to turn on each other, I, I hope the lower people down the population, the lower people down the social rankings understand that turning on your fellow man for whatever reason is not the way to do it. It's always been rich versus poor. It always has been. It's never been anything else. And when I say rich, I don't even mean like financially rich. I take that away. I, I'm going to reword that. It's been about the people with the power against people without the power. Don't you think it's a coincidence? Let me, let me, me, me raise a point with you. Do you remember the, the Occupy Wall Street movement? Do you remember when that was gaining traction? It was all about the 1% and the Occupy Wall Street movement, and that went crazy, and everyone was starting to actually understand that the bankers are destroying everybody, and it doesn't matter what color you are. If you're not one of the bankers, you're getting wrecked. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, they managed to fuel the racial fire, and then you had the poor whites against the poor blacks again. They managed to shift the focus. They did. Let's get the poor people fighting the poor people again. Because if the, if the poor people wake up and start fighting the people with all the power, they're going to realize how badly we're screwing them over. Yeah. And and I hope that if, if things really get out of control, that I hope it's not people fighting each other in Sainsbury's. I hope it's all of us at the parliament saying, get fucked. That's what I hope happens. But that's me but, being an optimist. But for that, well, that's, this is why I think th- these these podcasts are, are more important than our martial skills. Um, that that for for our civilization not to die which is obviously the, the plan of the powers that be they want to turn us into a kind of global technocracy where we are Completely. at best cattle slaves at worst dead actually maybe it's better yeah. being dead um yep. but for this plan not to succeed people have to understand who the enemy is and the enemy is not Completely. is not some somebody down the road who's got more cans of baked beans than you have the, the enemy Correct. is the person who's created the, the, the people who've created the situation. I mean, Bill Gates, these people should be facing crimes, a trial for crimes against humanity. And unless that agreed. happens, we've lost. No, completely agreed. I completely agree with you. And it's kind of like, it's almost, it's almost like a good place to kind of end. It's kind of one of the worst things about the modern world. And you're talking about the, the globalization of the world. One of the most worst things about it is, especially these leaders and these people who are in charge, they're so almost untouchable now. The reason they're doing these disgusting things is because they vanish on private jets. Like, where are they? Where even are they anymore? Do you, like, who knows where any of them even are? I I live in Romania, right? In Romania, there was a huge revolution in 1989. When the people got pissed off, they knew where the leader was. So they went to his house and they shot him in the head. They knew, they knew exactly where the dude was. But like, where is Biden? Is he in America? They say he is. What part? Where? Where are they all? You know, where is Klaus? Like, where the fuck even are yeah. these people? Like, they're, they're just floating around here, there, and everywhere. If, 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 if Paris sets on fire, Macron will be gone same day. Like, he'll be gone somewhere else, chilling on some island. It's, it's difficult to get to them, and that's why they've become so arrogant. And that's what they are. They're they are insanely arrogant. And I hope the universe teaches them a lesson because you look at like Nancy Pelosi during COVID telling people they're not allowed to leave their house and then going for her haircut. Like they're they're so arrogant. 
now. And, and they just seem to get away with it. And I hope, I hope there's some kind of balance to the universe, yin and yang, God, karma, whatever you want to call it. I hope sooner or it's later be their arrogance is punished. It's got to be God. I hope they're punished to the point where they finally wake up and realize they're human like everybody else. And that somehow they, they eventually learn their lesson because man, there's the, the things they're getting away with are, are go beyond any crimes of the past. The things they're getting away with are, are worse than criminal. It's truly disgusting. It's truly evil. Um, yeah, I've really enjoyed talking to you, Andrew. Um, uh, now tell me before we go, have you got any tips on how people can overcome their fear? Because there's a lot of fear around at the moment. What do we do? Yes, absolutely. So what I would say is that it's hard to be the only coward in the room. It's easy to be brave when everyone else is brave. I think we're evolutionarily designed to be that way. If you look at going over the top, they didn't send one man over the top by himself. You charged in a group, right? There's something about the fever of being in a group that makes you braver. So the first thing I would recommend is that if you have cowards in your life, try not to be too close to them. And I'm not saying get rid of your friends, but at least have some friends who are certainly brave. If I have to act bravely, if I had to charge into a burning house, I know which ones of my friends I'd want beside me. So you should know brave people. So you are, we all collapse to some degree to peer pressure. We're all programmable. Everyone understands that age old saying that if you look at your five best friends, that's who you're going to be. You know, look at the five people you hang around with most of, you're going to be the sum of those five people. If everybody knows that's true, then you should be very careful with who those five people are. If you choose five brave people, then what are you going to be? You're going to be brave. So the first thing I would say is pay attention to brave people, talk to brave people, uh, network with brave people, be friends with brave people. And then you're going to find it very easy to be brave. It's hard to be the only coward. It's actually quite difficult. And it's, that's the reason why the cowards find it hard to be brave because they only talk to cowards. And also, I think that the world we live in now, although the tech companies are trying to crush us, we do have an advantage with the internet. And if you listen to the right podcast, if you listen to this one, you're already listening to one of the right podcasts, find people who think like you online, anywhere else, join their communities, join their networks. I have a website, cobratake.com. I have some things on there. I have a, a, a network called The War Room with people who all think similar to I do and like you do. So find these networks and try and integrate with them and, and associate with them. And I think that's one of, I think that's 80% of the battle. And then the other hard, the hard part of the battle is the harder part, which is to insulate yourself against repercussion for being brave. And that's not as easy. I'm not going to say that's the easy part. But after you make a bunch of brave friends, and you start to do brave things. And then you need to start thinking, like I was saying earlier on the podcast, okay, if I'm going to act brave, how are they going to punish me for doing that? Well, okay, so I'll sell my house and I'll do something else, or I'll have a house in another country, or I'll buy a house under a company which is owned by someone who I'm good friends with, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I think those two things are all of it. If you only hang around with brave people and you no longer fear the repercussion of being brave, you're going to be a brave person. Yeah, that's really good advice. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd love to have you back on the podcast again sometime. You've been absolutely brilliant. Um, and, yeah, I'd love um, to, brother. I'd love to. No, it's been it's been really fun. Um, and um, remember, dear dear patrons and supporters, you can support me on Subscribestar, on Patreon, on um, Substack, and on Locals. And I really appreciate your support, and it helps me fight the fight. Thank you very much for listening, and thank you, Andrew Tate. You've been brilliant. Thank you, friend. Great.